So today I want to talk with you about his abiding intercession. Jesus abiding intercession. Chapter 7 of You Better Believe It. So the heavenly ministry of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is closely connected with the subject of his ascension into heaven, which we considered in our last chapter. It would be a mistake to imagine that when Jesus cried, it is finished on the cross, he had done all that he ever could do for his people. Certainly his work as a substitute and a, and a sacrifice for our sins was complete. But his resurrection, ascension and glorification were in a very real sense for us and form an important part of our salvation. So Romans 5 verse 10 tells us that we are not only saved by his death on Calvary, but that he continues to save us by the power of his life. The Bible indicates three main ways in which he does so. One main way is Christ, our mediator. So let's have a look at that. You know, Christ is our mediator. By his death upon the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ atoned for our sins. He bore on our behalf the punishment that our sins deserved. So he paid the price of our redemption. By his death, we are reconciled to God. And Jesus died as our savior, our substitute, our sin bearer. Now he lives as our mediator. Imagine this. When two countries have been at war and cannot come to peace on agreeable terms with one another, a representative from a third party will come who is not involved in the fighting and will sometimes act as a go-between. This is what they call a mediator. And, he, and, and this country mediates between the two countries that are at war and can't find agreeable terms to end the war. So the same thing is with God. You know, we were God's enemies because of our sin. But Jesus has not only died to save us from sin's consequences, but lives to keep us in righteous relationship with God. In right relationship with God. So 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 tells us that there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind. And his name is Jesus. It is through Jesus and Jesus alone that we have access to the Father. For it is the, he alone who has died to save us. And it is he alone who lives to keep us. So just, you know, remember that. Just keep a hold on that. We're going to go on another point. Jesus is our intercessor. Christ is our intercessor. But Jesus does not only live to act as our mediator at God's right hand. He is also there at our, as our intercessor. He is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. This is in Hebrews 7 verse 25. While he was here on earth, he offered up prayers and petition with loud cries and tears. You know, Jesus exemplified how we should live. So if Jesus offered up prayers and in petitions with loud cries and tears in Hebrews 5 verse 7, this, in the same way, he exemplifies the life that we should live, you know, to, to pray and petition on behalf of other people. And we can even cry and, you know, have cries and tears, you know, of the things that are going on in the world to, and to intercede on behalf of other people. Now, he is in heaven. Jesus is constantly praying for us. Now, he has entered into heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. So he is appearing in God's presence for us in Hebrews 9 verse 24. Why is Jesus in the presence of God? You wonder. Why is Jesus in the presence of God? He is in the presence of God for us. Yes, for you and for me. Why is he at God's right hand? You, you ask. Well, he is on God's right hand to intervene, intervene and intercede for us. So in the same way, we can intercede for other people in our lives. We can intercede for that neighbor. We can intercede for that family member that they will know Christ, that they will get to know the eternal life that they can give, that they can get, you know, from accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. 
Of course he is there by virtue of his own sovereign right. He is at God's right hand because he is king of kings and lord of lords. He is there because he rules the universe and because the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. But he is also there for us. Let me read this to you. He ever lives above for me to intercede. His all redeeming love, his precious blood to plead. His blood atoned for all our race and sprinkles now the throne of grace. The father hears him pray, his dear anointed one. He cannot turn away the presence of his son with confidence and I now dry nigh and father Abba father cry. That's such a beautiful, um, beautiful text, beautiful um, poem, you know, and it's so very true. You know, he is our intercessor. He intercedes for us so that we also have that example of interceding for others. So the third thing is Christ is our advocate. As our mediator, Jesus has brought about a reconciliation to God. As our intercessor, he is constantly praying for us. As an advocate, he defends us against the false accusations of Satan. Peter tells us that the enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. In 1 Peter 5 verse 8, Revelation 12 verse 10 suggests that his role is that of an accuser. And it's uh, and it seems as though he is allowing he is allowed to appear in the courts of heaven as a kind of counselor counsel for the prosecution. What a little sanctifi- sanctified imagination! Let us picture the scene. So let us picture this scene. Just just close your eyes and you know picture this scene in front of you. The heavenly judge, the judge of all the earth, is seated upon his throne. The prisoner on trial is charged with transgressing the eternal law, the word of God, which is you and me. You know, imagine yourself being on that, you know, on, uh, you know, charged and being, you know, being judged, charged with transgressing the eternal law, the word of God. Well, we tremble as we remember that like the prisoner, we too have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It is appointed unto us once to die and after death, the judgment. So we don't know Jesus. There's judgment waiting for us. If we know Jesus, I'm going to tell you what is happening next. The prosecution begins this case. It is extremely lengthy. Okay, but clear and convincing. The prisoner's whole life seems under review. So your and mine life is constantly under review. Sin after sin is listed. Catalogues of transgressions. Surely the verdict must be guilty. At last the prosecution brings his case to a conclusion. He insists that he has established his case to a... Uh, to, to get, uh, sorry... That he insists that he has established the guilt of the prisoner. He reminds the judge of the eternal law. The soul that the soul that sins shall surely die. The prisoner trembles. You and me tremble. The prosecution demands the sentence of eternal death. In desperation, the prisoner turns to his advocate, the counsel for the defendants. Defense. A heavenly lawyer takes. The stand before the judge. He acknowledges the prisoner's guilt. So see, obviously, you know, he acknowledges the guilt that we have. However, he does not seek to contest the charge brought against him. It is true that the prisoner is guilty. He deserves to die. Satan, the accuser, rubs his hands in glee. Yes, another victim. But what is the defense saying? It is true that the prisoner is guilty. But his advocate demands his release. The punishment for the crimes which he is guilty has already been taken. It has been borne by another. 
And you know who born that? The advocate approaches the judge and kneels before him. The advocate is Jesus. He kneels before the judge, before God. He stretches out his arms and shows him his hands. The nail prints are still visible. They're still visible. The price has been paid. The prisoner is free. In horror, Satan recoils from the sight. The nail prints are the symbols of his greatest defeat. The accuser has been overcome once again by the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 12, verse 10 and 11. He quits the courts of heaven and returns to his appointed place. The court is silent as the advocate speaks to the prisoner. Where is your accuser? Has no one condemned you? Then neither do I condemn you. The prisoner is pardoned. He was demonstrated demonstrably guilty and deserving of death. But he called upon the only advocate who could save him. No other defense is adequate against the accuser accusations of the adversary. But thank God against the accusations. Uh, uh, but thank God no other defense is necessary. We have an advocate with the father. 1 John 2 verse 1. His name is Jesus. So I want to encourage you today that your sins have been forgiven. And Jesus is our mediator. He is our advocate and he is our intercessor. God bless you.